Okay. It is my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker. Dr. Winston Bembo is our own. Winston is the director of the Veritas Project, and Winston got his PhD in physics from University of California, Santa Cruz. During his PhD, Winston participated in the construction of the Milagro Very High Energy Gamma Ray Observatory. And after his PhD, Winston was a visiting scientist at Max Planck Institute, where he participated in all aspects of the Hess experiment. And he had a significant contribution to the success of the Hess, of the Hess project. After his time in the Hess experiment, Winston moved back to the US, where he is making a significant contribution to the Veritas project, and he is actively involved in building next generation of the Very High Energy Observatory, CTA. With his decades of experience in building and operating Cherenkov arrays, there is no doubt that Winston is among the best people to tell us about the golden anniversary of the Very High Energy Gamma Ray Astronomy. So, welcome. Thank you, Anna. Um, so, as the title might allude, it's the uh, 50th anniversary of uh, ground-based gamma ray astronomy um, in the world. Um, this is a field that's very much founded by the Smithsonian. Um, and when I say very high energy gamma ray astronomy, I mean gamma ray astronomy above 100 GeV. And just to give you a brief synopsis of how this works, you have a source of uh, cosmic gamma rays. These gamma rays propagate um, to Earth, they interact in the upper atmosphere, creating a particle cascade. These particles give off Cherenkov light, which illuminate the ground in a pool of about 300 meters wide. And what you can do is you can put a crude optical telescope in this pool, um, and anywhere in this pool, and you thereby detect the gamma ray. And what you do, this technique was pioneered on Mount Hopkins by the Whipple 10 meter telescope right here. And what you can do is you can put multiple telescopes into this pool, and effectively you can come up with a detector of, of order square kilometer in size, which is what you need to detect the very low fluxes that are emitted in this regime. In fact, the fluxes are so low, you really can't do this with a satellite. There's just no way you fly a satellite that, that, that's big enough to do this type of astronomy. Um, the other key thing you want to remember about very high energy gamma ray astronomy is that the radiation is non-thermal. You know, it doesn't give off a distribution like this, like from stars. Um, and that basically means that it's produced by particle accelerators, and it's nature's most powerful particle accelerators, like this AGN here. I'm um, just to give you a scope of what you need here. This is the LHC. The I think it's uh, the mass the center mass energy now is 13 TeV, and to produce TeV light or VHE light, which I'll use interchangeably, you need 100 TeV particles or higher to produce this, and you typically get uh, spectral energy distributions where this is energy or this is power and this is energy that have the two humps. Um, this is synchrotron radiation typically and this radiation can either be leptonically or origin meaning electrons or hadronic origins. Um, and oftentimes you know we have low powered objects um, uh, that are more highly peaked that we see in TV gamma rays. Um, so going back to the thesis of this talk, gamma ray astronomy uh, started in 1967 out at the Whipple Observatory. You can see the uh, Whipple Observatory base camp right here in this image. You can see the mountain here. That's the same mountain right here. And Trevor Weeks drove out some searchlights right here. Um, there's two World War II surplus searchlights. There's a photomultiplier instrumented at the focus right there, and they ran some cables into here. And you quite literally tried to count the number of extensive air showers from these things pointed at a source, counted a number on source, counted a number off source, and tried to see if you did detect any gamma rays. Now, no rational person would have assumed this would work, but this was the uh, um, <laughs> the first attempt. And the real reason Trevor went out in 1967 was to be begin construction of a Whipple 10 meter gamma ray telescope. This was the first telescope at the then Mount Hopkins Observatory. And this telescope took about a year to construct, which I just find amazing. And it was dedicated in October 23rd of 1968. And you can see this fine picture from the dedication. And I I truly love this jacket. Um, <laughs> um, so it was dedicated in 1968, but it took them a full 21 years before they detected their first source of VHE gamma rays. So it took, I don't know if it was pure dedication or pure Irish stubbornness to get it um, there to work, um, but the real reason this technique ended up working, you can see initially it only had a one photomultiplier tube as the detector and one for the off source. A measurement um, was an installation of a 37 pixel camera in 1983. This was funded by the Department of Energy in order for this uh, technique to be a pathfinder for neutrino astronomy. And the reason is, is that these Cherenkov showers, when imaged in a camera like this, have an elliptical shape. 
And you can crudely image this elliptical shape and use it to reject the background light, which is about 10,000 to 1 times more numerous than the gamma ray showers. So it took about 100 hours to detect the Crab Nebula in 1989. And so throughout the 90s, they started to develop the instrumentation a bit more. Some of my colleagues over in Germany created a stereoscopic array that I mentioned earlier, and they used a, a small array of five telescopes. These things had a diameter of about uh, four meters going across. Um, there were five telescopes. And what happens with these small telescopes is you can reject uh, local muons in a the shower. These things are just you know, about 50 meters above the telescope. These muons radiate Cherenkov radiation, and they just light up a telescope. But they will only light up one. So if you have multiple telescopes triggering simultaneously, you can eliminate all of these muons at the trigger level. And then you can use the average shape information to eliminate the rest of your background, and it works amazingly well. So that was a great uh, advance to stereoscopic technique. And the other thing you can do is use higher resolution cameras. So WIP will evolve to a 331 pixel camera. And CAT really did this well. They used a small telescope you see right here. It was about six meters diameter, but a 548 pixel camera. And you start applying really fancy techniques. And there's nobody like the French to come up with some great maximum likelihood stuff with statistics um, to do this really well. Um, and you eventually knock the sensitivity down in 10 years where you detect the crab at 100 hours to just one hour. Um, you know, unfortunately, this is a very typical picture of the skies at the CAT telescope up in the Pyrenees. Beautiful by day, um, not so great by night. OK, so that's how we evolved in the 2000s. I got a question earlier today about what happened to the Whipple 10 meter. And so this is the Whipple 10 meter um, you know, in its heyday. Um, we decommissioned it um, in, uh, starting in 2011. We took the mirrors off, and then in 2013, we took it down. The Minerva uh, Planet Finding Telescope is there now. I mean, the reason we took it down was that it was actually still able to do uh, uh, astrophysics you know, at a competitive level in terms of very specific topics. But it was starting to rust out, and we wanted to take it down before anybody got hurt. And so that's sad. Um, but now, where do things stand? Uh, well, there are four, currently four ver major projects. You see the Veritas array right here. It's four 12-meter uh, Cherenkov telescopes. You see the Magic project here. It's two 17-meter telescopes. You see the Hess project, which is four 12-meter telescopes. This is not photoshopped in. That's an actual telescope. It's 28 meters diameter. And there's something here. It's called an extensive air shower array called Hawk. And it's very similar to the Milagro project on which I did my uh, PhD thesis. In fact, it actually uses some of the electronics I soldered more than 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> but, but it's very different. It's an all-sky monitor with reduced sensitivity. And the upshot of all these instruments is, is that Veritas is the most sensitive VHE instrument in the world. And we detect the Crab Nebula in under 30 seconds, which compared to 2000 in an hour, you know, we've increased by another factor of you know, a few hundred. So things are going very well. So what does all this mean? Well, it's, all this advancement in sensitivity has fueled a rapid growth in very high-energy gamma ray astronomy. When I started in 1996, it was at the time of the announcement of a third gamma ray source. In 2002, when the first of this wave of instrumentation came along, there were 10 very high-energy gamma ray sources. They were all, some of them were a little dicey. And now there are about 200 from 10 different source classes. You can see this all the different sources and galactic coordinates shown right here, but different dots are different flavors of sources, supernova remnants, AGN, binaries, you name it, uh, you know, stellar winds, all kinds of different things. And you can see that there's very much, if you are into astrophysics and non-thermal sources, there's something for everybody these days. OK, so go, moving on to Veritas. What does Veritas do? Well, we study very high energy gamma rays from astrophysical sources. This is our energy range right here, 85 GeV to 30 TeV. We've been running now for a decade. We upgraded our telescope in 2012. Um, this knocked our threshold down by about 40%. Um, and uh, we've basically doubled our sensitivity in, the, in those initial five years. We get about 1,000 hours a year in dark time and about 30, 300 hours a year in gray time. I mean, these are some of our... Uh, our technical specs, you can read it faster than I can talk. But the main thing I like to point out to people is that we have significant systematic errors. The flux is about 20%, and that's because our atmosphere is a calor our calorimeter. And most of our spectra are fit by power laws, um, and the systematic error on our photon index is about 0.1. Just quickly looking in on Veritas again, here's the 12 meter dish. The focal distance here again is 12 meters. It's a tessellated mirror, so these are about 60 centimeters across, flat to flat. The width of the camera is about two meters, so about the size of a car. Has a field of view about three and a half degrees. Every pixel is about an inch across. You can hold one in your hand. And while this thing only has 500 pixels, which doesn't sound very impressive when you've got eight megapixels in your pocket, these cameras take about a billion pictures a second. And getting all that to work together is really the trick in this business. Okay. 
So where do we stand after a decade of Veritas? Well, we had our 10-year celebration this year. You can see the fine poster and, a, and an image from the celebration. We've had 11,000 hours of data. This data is, as I mentioned earlier, is there's, you know, it's at better quality, so it's two times better sensitivity, 40% lower threshold. And we're getting more data annually than we ever expected because we didn't used to be able to observe during moonlight. We can now do this. We've developed techniques. So we used to only get 800 hours a year. Now we're getting 1,300 hours a year. And we managed to slash the budget, which makes my agencies very happy. We've put out about 100 articles and 55 PhD theses. So there's no way I can tell you all of the scientific accomplishments. And so I've decided to go at this, you know, much like a very classic rock band doing, you know, their shows these days. You know, what do I say, the new stuff or the classics? And so I've decided to give you like a top 10 list with some of the new highlights sprinkled in. Okay, so what, what, what is our source catalog, our album catalog? Well, right now we have 59 sources from eight uh, varieties of objects. You can see them on the sky here. This is a cutout here. This is a cutout here. Um, you know, much of it is extra galactic because, you know, much of our sky is extra galactic. We don't see the galactic center area very well. It's down low on the horizon and our threshold spikes. Um, but so where do we come in? Well, you can see I'm going to intersperse some nice photos here. This is a, the Galactic, uh, the Milky Way, and Veritas at night. And so I'll start with a galactic source. And why do we look at galactic sources? Well, one is the origin of cosmic rays. You can see Victor Hess in 1912 all dressed up before he flies up in an air balloon to discover uh, cosmic radiation. Um, he was hoping to find that the cosmic radiation would actually go down as he went up in a hot air balloon. And he actually found that it went up. He ended up getting a Nobel Prize because he found out it was coming from the sky. Um, but his origin is still a kind of a mystery. I mean, everybody has long suspected it comes from supernovas, but in order to prove this, you had to do basically three things. You had to detect 100 TeV gamma rays from a supernova remnant. Well, this has happened with the Hess project more than a dozen times now, so you can kind of just say check on that. Um, you have to show that supernova, re supernova remnants accelerate gamma rays um, uh, via hadronic processes. This, you know, maybe we need to do still. Um, and then you also have to show that many supernova remnants generate many cosmic rays. Okay, if you do these three things, you can say you've maybe discovered the origin of cos galactic cosmic rays. Well, here's the Tycho uh, supernova remnant. Okay, you can see this beautiful Chandra image. Unfortunately, it's very much a point source for us. Here it is here. Here's our PSF. So we get a nice blob, if you will. Um, so unfortunately, we're not going to make very pretty images like Chandra. It's, you know, it's about a 500, 400-year-old uh, supernova remnant. And what you can see here is the Veritas spectrum here, the Fermi spectrum here, and a nice hadronic model. And, okay, and this is a little bit of older data, but you can see very well that uh, it has this characteristic sort of pion bump in the spectral energy distribution where this is power, this is energy. And this was sort of a first evidence for hadronic acceleration in a supernova remnant. <laughs> There's actually some very nice remnants from the Hess project that show you know, these very resolved features, but unfortunately, they're all you know, leptonically modeled and not well hadronically modeled. Now, of course, that was an early result from us. If you look at more later data, you see we have a, a much more well-defined spectrum. Here's more Fermi data. Some of the models to the earlier um, Veritas data, and you can see that some of the models, these hadronic models to the earlier Veritas data overshoot our spectrum, which is now a little bit softer. But the upshot is, is that it's still clearly a hadronic accelerator, but the maximum energy to which you're accelerating these protons is now unclear. You can see our updated sky map as well. Here's the uh, X-ray image. Here's the new star stuff in the centroid of our image. Um, and you can see that, um, you can see that the, the TeV gamma ray emission is coming from a region right here where the supernova remnant might be interacting with this molecular cloud up there. So we have a hadronic accelerator. Some of the emission may be coming from a supernova remnant interacting with the molecular cloud. A middle-aged supernova remnant might be more likely for Veritas to see some resolved shell-type features. And you see that here in IC443, which is about 3 to 10K years old. Um, and you have a 200-hour exposure from Veritas, and you do start to see some nice, more resolved features. And it's brightest again right here, where a supernova remnant is interacting with a molecular cloud. And I'll just point you to the reference where you can see all the different uh, contour plots. Um, and again, you see IC443. This is Fermi data. And this is some older Veritas data. Um, and again, you see this clear hadronic pion bump. And so while one case may be a case study, when you start to get multiple examples of hadronic acceleration and supernova remnants, you can start checking off that list I showed you from Tycho. 
And so clearly in Veritas, everything is always rainbows. Things are going great. We've checked off one thing. Well, what about the other thing? And you may have heard me talk about this before. It's via third step where highlight number two is the origin of cosmic rays. And Veritas looked at M82 for 180 hours, give or take, in 2008, 2009. And as you can see, we had a nice result because it got published in Nature. And why is this? Well, M82 is a star-forming galaxy. And if you have lots of stars forming, you have lots of stars dying. When you have lots of stars dying, you have lots of the supernova. And if you have lots of supernovas, these things should naturally be making cosmic rays. These cosmic rays will interact with lots of gas at the center of M82. And when you have super cosmic rays and gas, you get gamma rays. And so if you detect M82, you plausibly get a gamma ray emission. And that's what we found. We found less than one gamma ray per hour. So this is very much a business of patience. Okay. But by measuring uh, the... Uh, the, the flux of M82 and very high energy gamma rays, you're about able to get the, the cosmic ray density in M82, and it turns out to be 500 times that of the Milky Way. Um, and so it turns out that you start going through all the modeling and working through this data, it turns out that if supernovas are the primary source of cosmic rays in the Milky Way, this density that you measure right here requires a 10 to 30 times higher supernova rate, you know, given the volumes of the medium and the scape uh, lifetimes. Um, in M82, and that's exactly what is observed by others. And so when I put this document into Nature, Leslie Sage actually wanted me to say that we had solved the mystery of the origin of cosmic rays. I was a little bit more conservative, which he didn't necessarily like too much, but he went with it. And, uh, <laughs> and so, so we're pretty far along on that mystery, and that made us very happy. Um, Okay, so moving on, this is Veritas with the Moon, Jupiter, and Venus. We, we look at lots of different kinds of objects, you know, in Veritas. And so we'd like to explain the unknown. And so this is TEVJ 2032. It's the first very high energy unidentified objects. About two thirds of the objects in the very high energy sky have no known association. And so we look at them and we try to understand what these things are. This is the first one that was discovered in 2002, and we looked at it for 50 hours and got the very best ever detection. Now, lots of people have you know, theorized what this could possibly be over the years. Um, and I've heard things as far as like a gamma ray burst remnant, and you know, everybody likes to use the word dark accelerator, it gets people excited. Um, and anyways, this is the Veritas uh, map here. Um, and here you see a Fermi pulsar. And what you see in the Veritas map is it's elongated and asymmetric. Um, there's no energy dependent morphology, but if you look here now at the uh, radio map, you see a void. If you, these are Veritas contours now. If you look here at Spitzer maps, you see a void. These voids are pretty rare, it turns out. Um, you've got the Fermi pulsar right in this void. And what it basically boils down to is you've got TEV emission right in this void. You've got a pulsar in this void. So something, whatever created this void, say a supernova explosion, you know, you left behind a pulsar, which then fills this thing up with electrons, and effectively you get a pulsar wind nebula in here. And these things are among the most common TEV sources. And so it turns out that this great mystery that had lots of theoretical papers over the years turns out to be a very common pulsar wind nebula. Perhaps something more exciting um, is HESJ0632 plus 057. This was the only point-like unidentified source in the initial HES survey. It's in the Monoceros region. And Veritas started looking at it, and right away when we started looking at it, we were like, hey, this thing seems to be variable. And we had a lot of hemming and hawing because we were like, uh, Hess said it was constant. And uh, we were like, uh-oh. So we started looking at it, and we looked at it more and more and more and more. And over time, what you see here is a periodogram. We ended up realizing, along with our friends in Swift who were looking at it simultaneous with us, that it had a, a period. And it turned out to be a binary with a period of 315 days, and is associated with a massive BE star. And so and this is pretty big news because it's only one of six very high energy gamma ray binaries now known. And so we're increasing the population and slowly but surely resolving all of these unidentified sources. So here's a nice picture of Veritas at sunset. We actually do some very interesting things at sunset and sunrise. And one of the interesting things we did at sunrise one day is back in June of 2011 is we were taking a snapshot on BL Lasserte, the eponymous BLAC object, and it was just before the sun came up, we, we just took a quick poke at it, and all of a sudden this thing is flaring. Now, the crab turns out to be the brightest DC point source in the, the bright sky. And we looked at Bialak, and sure enough, it was brighter than this thing, and its flux tailed off right before uh, the sun came up. 
And so we said, hey, let's tell everybody about this. And my friend Alan Marsher, uh, he happened to be looking at this thing with the VLBA. And right at the tail end of his flare, which decays pretty quickly, he said, hey, Whiston, I happened to notice that we had the birth of a new uh, radio feature, a knot, right by the core. Um, this thing simultaneous to your flare event, this seems pretty interesting. It ties the gamma ray emission to, you know, the birth of a new feature in this jet. And okay, well, that sounds good. Again, like, you know, one time's a case study, but another time makes it, you know, a viable phenomenon. And again, we had the same thing happen in October of 2016. We had a major flare. You see the rise time here in 140 minutes. It decays in about 40 minutes. And again, we have a birth of yet another knot. And so whatever seems to be causing these TEV flares, um, seems to be associated with the birth of things near the supermassive black hole at the center of them. Okay, I showed this a little earlier in the ITC symposium. So we're understanding where um, these uh, gamma ray emissions forming in AGN jets, but we also understand now how. You can look, this is the optical data, this is X-ray data, this is Fermi gamma ray data, this is our gamma ray data, this is a vanilla blazar. Um, you know, this is not a particularly spectacular detection, but what I wanted to show is that the data now in all, in all the bands are so good when we take these things, we can model these things. This is the best fit model here in black. The gray area um, is the range of allowed models. And so the models now for these things, because the data are so good, are so fully constrained that we can actually establish ranges of model parameters for which things work, and they're no longer just degenerate models. And the ranges of parameters are good to about a factor of two, which sounds terrible when you're building bridges, but when you're doing astrophysics, it's remarkable. Okay, so here's Veritas at twilight. You know, it's truly a spectacular looking instrument. This, this telescope has actually moved now, but so it's an old picture. But so some of the things we do at dark is we look for dark matter. Um, and so we've actually comprehensively surveyed the entire catalog of dwarf galaxies, or at least one that existed a few years ago, um, looking for dark matter. And what happens is, is in these dwarf galaxies that are believed to have high concentrations of dark matter, these dark matter particles may self-annihilate and create detectable fluxes of TeV gamma rays. Now, if we had detected dark matter, I assure you, you would have heard of it by now. Um, so we haven't. But what you can do is you can use the fact that we haven't to create limits on a dark matter cross-section. And I'm just showing you here that we've done this for every plausible uh, dark matter decay channel around. One of these things touches the thermal cross-section. That's of importance to dark matter enthusiasts. Um, and what I will tell you is this is only through 2012 data that made it into our FizRevD. And by the time Veritas is done with its dark matter legacy program in 2019, we will push this down by another order of magnitude. Okay. So Veritas is clearly an unusual instrument. There's not a whole lot of telescopes like it out there in the world. Um, and so we have some unusual stories from the crab to tell you. Many of you have seen these fine pictures before. You know, it's astronomy's most well-studied object. It's also our brightest steady TV gamma ray source and the standard reference for our field. As I mentioned before, we detect it in 30 seconds. So obviously nothing should ever surprise us with this object, right? Well, it turns out that that's not true. <laughs> and so back in uh, 2011, we decided to take a look at the Veritas crab data, of which we had several hundred hours. And we decided to you know, bin it periodically. And what you see here is a phasogram. You, know, you take the radio ephemeris, you make a phasogram with it, and you can see the Veritas DC emission. But if in the phasogram, you also see that you have pulsed emission. Now, pulsed emission at gamma rays from, you know, is not a surprise. Fermi sees this you know, from a thing. They'll list it in all of their talks as like one of the highlights of Fermi is how many gamma ray pulsars there are. But what's remarkable and surprising about this is that we see it above 100 GeV. This is the uh, spectrum of just the pulsed emission from Veritas, uh, or you know, from Veritas and from all instruments. And you can see at lower energies, it comes up. And everybody and their brother and sister expected it to cut off. And it didn't. And so when I talked to Alice Harding about this, she's like, I have no explanation for this. You know, I'm not a pulsar expert, so I'll leave it at that. But the fact that we see it above 100 GeV, and now it's seen all the way up to about a TeV, is pretty remarkable. Okay? And so, of course, this made it into science because you know, it eliminated, I mean, you'll have to forgive me if it's the polar cap or the outer gap uh, enthusiast's favorite model. Um, but uh, that was a surprise. But okay, so that was one surprise from the Crab Nebula that we had, but were there more surprises? 
And well, if you follow things in the gamma ray band, there have been several bright MEV GEV flares seen from the crab, and the first half dozen of these always happened at the full moon. Now, Veritas, through its techniques, can actually observe at the full moon nowadays. We have filters we can put on and do this, but we don't typically bring staff out there just for cost-benefit reasons. Um, and so we weren't able to do this. Um, and that, it, it, that you get these flares, and you can see this flare right here is a factor of 20 flare in the gamma ray flux that Fermi detects from a crab. You know, it's a, you know, it is very surprising and difficult to model. Well, finally, in um, March of 2013, it happened when we had Veritas observers out there. And so we, we took observations, of course. You can see our observations, our flux points are shown right here. And so while it's going crazy in Fermi, it's clearly doing nothing in Veritas. Um, and so, so there were no Ver Veritas variations, and this is actually the delta, not the Veritas flux, so we detect the crab. Um, so if there were any Ver Veritas variations in the TEV flux, they have to be 100 times smaller than those measured in the MEV, GEV band. Okay. And that tells you a lot. It tells you that whatever you know, structure is creating the things down at lower energy, it's not happening up at higher energies. And we've observed, I think, a half a dozen of these flares since, and there's just nothing. Um, there we go. So Veritas. You know, it, it, I, I find it inspirational. I think many others. This is a painting that somebody you know, made for us, gosh, back in 2011 or something of that nature. And so we've discovered a lot of new classes of very high energy gamma ray blazar. And this is one of the very first ones that I, we detected. We got it during a flare in February of 2008. You know, we typically didn't detect it when we were looking at it. It was one of the earliest targets we had. And then it popped up. And it didn't actually do anything in Swift. It's just a light curve you see here. And then later when it popped up in Swift, we actually didn't really see much of anything. Um, we've discovered um, what this object is, a new class of blazars. Typically, we see these things called high-frequency peaked BLAC objects. These are lower-powered blazars that peak at higher frequencies. We don't typically see these lower-peaked objects, which have more power but peak at lower energies. And you see this is the TEV band right here, so you can see why we wouldn't necessarily see this type of object. But when they flare, these distributions shift this way or shift up enough that you might pick it up. So we detected this one, and since then, we've actually discovered four more of these things. In fact, all of the objects of this class have been discovered by Veritas. And as you've gone further and further on, we don't just see these during flares, but we've actually detected the low state. We've detected the low state of this one and 3C66A. And in addition, we've detected two flat spectrum radio quasars. So we're really expanding the class. I mean, if you were to hear a, a symposium by me, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we'd only talk about Markarian 421 or 501, only be talking about HBLs. But now, there's a whole variety of these things. And it turns out if I threw an SED at you, which I'm not going to do, it turns out that the standard synchrotron self-Compton model, which everybody loves, there's actually a model that's preferred to it. This works, but it's out of equipartition. And in this type of model, a synchrotron self-Compton plus an external Compton component, which I will get to later, is preferred. But why is this inspirational? Well, when I showed this uh, result, um, we found this result, it turned out that we had two extragalactic sources in a single field of view. And some of my friends are artists down in Tucson, and they work in museums. And they said, well, that's pretty cool, and they like the backstory. So they asked me to make some artistic images to show in the Arizona State Museum back then. And so I made a nice display, and you can see I'm a little bit younger back then. <laughs> um, but, you know, we got it up there. And I was like, okay, this is great. You know, we'll never get two, uh, you know, extra galactic, well, I shouldn't say never. But it'll be a long time before we get two extra galactic sources in a single field of view again. And then, lo and behold, three years later, we now have three extra galactic sources in a single field of view. And so this is the only reason this thing looks a little bit bigger is I had to drop the Z saturation down so that this fainter source would show up. So I got very excited when I made this plot. I ran down to Dan Fabricant and I said, here you go. And he's like, well, that's very nice, but how many optical sources are in there? And I'm like, you're right, there's 800. Um, and so, you know, lesson learned. And I was here like, you know, we've only been doing this for, you know, 20 odd years, you know, come on, give me a break. And so, you know, I was saying, like, well, how can I get the optical astronomers to finally accept us, TEV guys? And so what we came up with was the Terra Bird. <laughs> and so we're now making constellations, 
in our spare time. And so while this is a little bit of a joke, it actually is very serious in that it shows exactly what I've been telling you about this, this whole thing. You have a high frequency peaked BLAC object. You have another high frequency peak BLAC object. You have a flat spectrum radio quasar. You have an intermediate peaked object, which you see at the DC level, and you have one you only see during flares here. And this kind of tells the whole story of a variety of blazars that we're detecting with Veritas, all within 10 degrees. Um, now, mind you, we're going to be talking about the CTA telescope a little bit later. All of this fits into a single field of view of CTA. So Veritas is fun. If you get at the right, if you get at the 2F point of Veritas, you can make your head the size of this 12 meter mirror, or you can see yourself in a dizzying array with the various mirror facets. It's a lot of fun to kind of play with our toy. Um, and so what is the most fun thing I could have done with Veritas if you asked me 10 years ago? And that would be detecting a quasar at a redshift of one. And why is that fun? Well, qua uh, gamma rays coming from a quasar are absorbed by the extragalactic background light as they propagate to Earth. Okay, this extragalactic background is sort of like the sum of all light emitted throughout the history of a universe. It's a really important uh, quantity for cosmology as such. And so what this effectively does is you have a quasar that emits uh, photons with a spectrum that might look like this, and it effectively softens it. And if there's a lot of EBL, and nobody really knows how much there is, we know how little there might be, but not necessarily how much, if there's a lot of it, it'll be a lot of absorption, your observed spectrum will be softened and maybe turn over like that. And if it's just a little bit, it'll be less softened. And so, you know, to, when I was a graduate student, you know, we didn't dream with the, the technology we had back then. We would ever really be able to do it with that type of stuff. But, you know, it became more plausible with Veritas, and this was a realistic dream. And lo and behold, we've now done it. Um, in April 2015, my friend Daniel uh, gave me a phone call from Japan. He said, Winston, you have to look at this object right now. Uh, Fermi Lats alerted us. We're, we're looking at it right now in Spain. We're seeing it. You have to get on it. This is really important. And so we, sure enough, we got on it right away. And what you see is that Veritas detected it um, during this flare. This is our spectrum right here. We got about a 10 standard deviation detection of this object which is at a redshift of about one. Mind you, the light travel time at this redshift is about half the age of a known universe. So this is the Fermi spectrum during the flare. This is the observed spectrum. If you correct out the absorption, this is what our spectrum would look like. And so despite the fact that it's at a redshift of one, it actually isn't unusual that we saw this thing. And so, which I just, it just blew my mind. Like, oh, I, I, when I, we first got it, I thought, oh, for sure, we're going to destroy all the EBL models out there. It turns out that no, that's not the case. But so what you can do is you can turn this around and say, okay, given that what we, we saw, how much EBL could there possibly be? And that's what this plot shows. This is the EBL density here, density versus wavelength, and this is what our limits are from this detection, this blue line here, and here's some results from an ensemble, basically every gamma ray blazar ever detected, you know, you know, converted into an EBL limit, okay, this is like given how hard these things could possibly be, you know, what is the limit, and you see that our single source detection basically beats all of the other information combined. And so why is this important? Well, these are the lower limits from HST and Spitzer based on galaxy counts. And basically what this is starting to show you is that there is no extra, extra contribution to the extragalactic background light. Okay, and you can do this again with an ensemble of sources. We just released this this summer where we derived EBL constraints based on eight very high energy gamma ray blazars. And you see our limits here of a shaded band is what is allowed based on these eight blazers. There's about 800 hours of data that went into this. And again, you see our limits. These are the lower limits, again, from Spitzer and HST. And you see they're right there, right at the level of galaxy counts. Really, and this has implications for pop three stars and you know, dark matter and all kinds of things. Okay, well, there's a lot of things going on there, but Veritas is not yet complete, much like this image. Um, and so we've talked about detecting gamma rays from a rim of a black hole. I told you about the BL Lasserte flare, but this is another flare we got back in 2008 from M87. And we have a, back with Dan Harris, we had an ongoing program with the VLBA and Chandra where we would monitor the M87 flux, and then we'd also monitor it with, the, with TV instruments. 
And you see, um, M87 is, is not a galaxy where you're looking down the barrel of a jet, but you're looking at it off axis. You see the beautiful Chandra images, the radio images, the HST images, and you see these knots. Um, and so what you do is you monitor the various components, and if you happen to see a flare in TV gamma rays, you say, okay, I'll try to cross-correlate it. Like, is it coming from the core black hole or maybe out in one of the knots or something like this? And what we saw when we got this nice flare of M87 back in 2008 was that you had a nice uh, radio flare in the vicinity of a black hole. And so this helps us establish the core as the source of a VHE emission. But of course, are we sure we know the answer? And it turns out that M87 now has had three TEV flares with day scale variations, and each one has a different and maddening multi wavelength behavior. In 2005, we had a VHE flare when the core was low. But this HST1 knot, um, there we go, out there was flaring. Hmm. We had told about 2008, and then in 2010, the VHE flared and HST1 knot and the core were low. So, you know, who knows what's going on? It doesn't make any sense, although the core had just flared. But if you look at this 2010 flare from M87, you see it right here. You have sub day scale variability. Um, and that tells you that the emission region, whatever is causing the, em the uh, emission from M87, has to be smaller than the, the solar system. You're talking, you know, kiloparsec scale jets here, and you have something that's smaller than the scale of the solar system causing this. Now, obviously, we don't understand everything about M87, and so we're starting to run campaigns with the new Event Horizon Telescope to help resolve things round about the region of a black hole. Um, so going back to Parks 1441, so we know that there's micro things going on in these jets. Well, this is a different thing. This is this quasar out at redshift 1. You see the spectral energy distribution here. This is now um, optical data. This is x-ray data, which curiously goes all the way. The synchrotron stuff goes all the way up to 30 keV. And you see the gamma ray thing. And you see this flare now by a factor of 100 in all the bands, which is what allowed us to see it. Um, if you look at the light curves over the various years, you can see that they're all correlated, so it has to be one single emission region. And if you look at the time scale of variations, it's, it's less than two weeks. Um, the other thing that you note about this thing is that not only do the photons have to escape this extragalactic background to get to us, but they also might be absorbed by the same process, gamma rays hitting photons and just evaporating you know, right down here. Um, they have to get outside the broadline region, this area very near the black hole. So it has to come far away from the black hole. Um, because the optical depth there is a tau of 9. Um, and so if you pop this through a model which has very reasonable parameters, um, but except for the fact that it has a very large uh, emission region size, 200,000 times the Schwarzschild radius, if you start modeling this thing, you start getting the big picture that we have the first evidence for large-scale TeV emission from an AGN. So you have... You have both the micro emission during flares, you have macroscopic emission during flares, you have it when new features are born. So you have a lot of different complex things going on in TV AGN. Okay, some of us watch a lot of TV. I'm not one of them, but I do watch this show. And winter is coming, and it's been told to me by multiple sources. Um, and so, um, so we have a lot of multi-messenger initiatives in Veritas. So I told you about the Hawk Telescope, it's just all-sky monitor. So one of the things it can do is alert you to transients, but the other thing it can do is look at large-scale um, uh, new TV structures. Um, and so it's found about a dozen or so new TV sources. This is one of, these are two of them that it found. And so Veritas followed up on this thing with about 60 hours of observations. And you can see from our contour map that we see one of them very well and one of them we don't see at all. And it turns out if you start looking even more deeply, we actually don't see many of the new Hawk sources, which is, I'll call it troubling. Um, there are plausible physical reasons. It could be that they're so hard spectrum that you know, they're just ramping up right after us, or there could be other more nefarious reasons. Um, but I won't speculate. Um, but this new source that we've seen was focused on the positive. Um, it turns out is associated with the Pulsar Wind Nebula DA495, or one of these uh, uh, Green's catalog sources right here. And so we're able to identify some of the new sources pointed out by the Hawk instrument. Uh, and why this is important is that Hawk can resolve sources that are much larger than you typically would do in a Cherenkov business, meaning three degrees across and things like this um, features. And so Veritas can find some of these things is very important. 
Um, LIGO has made a lot of news recently, and so I wanted to mention this. Um, we get alerts from LIGO when they detect something. They're obviously confidential. We don't go sharing them with the world, and, but we do follow up on them. And on January uh, 5th of this year, um, LIGO sent us alert. It actually was perfectly visible for Veritas. This is um, a number of visible hours to Veritas when it went off. This is their 90-something uh, percent containment region, or 50 percent, I can't remember exactly which one it was. Um, but we received the alert, and we tiled the entire northern sort of high-probability containment area within four hours. And what we do is you can see the tiling right here. We spent five minutes on each exposure just going across the sky, filling in this whole thing. And within four hours of this thing going off, we had tiled the whole region with a limit of about 50 percent crab flux. So, I mean, I... Uh, 10 to the minus 12, give or take. Um, and so, um, so we, you know, we're trying to come up and follow up on the LIGO alerts um, whenever we get them. Other things that we tend to do with multi-messenger thing is that IceCube has upward going neutrinos, um, and we follow up on these things, trying to look for their progenitors. We followed up on about 20 or 30 of these things, and we do so very rapidly with a delay of about two minutes because it's in the GCN network. You know, we also follow up on gamma ray bursts. Okay, so those are some of the highlights um, from Veritas over the years. I wanted to say a big thank you um, to Trevor Weeks. Uh, many of you know Trevor passed away about three years ago. Trevor was very much um, sort of a grandfather or a father of our field of research. This is him as a young man when he's older and then at my wedding in 2008. Trevor was also very much a friend. You may recall I said it took 22 years to detect the first source without somebody willing to suffer through 22 years of pain, you know, I wouldn't be standing here today, and, uh, you know, it's just very much, very much a character and will be missed. Um, and so, you know, he inspired this new generation. These are all TV gamma ray astronomers. It's our TV gamma ray photo. Um, Michael discovered the first uh, TV AGN. I'd probably be honest to say I found the most. Um, <laughs> He's found the most TEV pulsar wind nebula. Um, you get the idea. Most TEV unidentified objects. Uh, you get the idea. It's a, it's a, it's a smattering of characters. Um, okay, so the next generation was what I'm trying to highlight. How do we make the next generation? Well, you see the current generation of instruments right here. You have a Cherenkov light pool. Um, basically, it's you know it's about 150 meters radius, 300 meters across. There's a sweet spot for nailing it with all four telescopes. It's in the, if it lands, the center of it lands in this region right here. But most showers miss that. Okay, so correspondingly, you're not doing the best job you can with an array like Veritas. So obviously, the thing you want to do is get you know a bigger array of telescopes so that every shower that hits it, you're doing a great job on. I mean, you have a larger detection area, meaning you get more showers, you get more images per shower. You know, with more images, you get more averaging, so you do better gamma ray reconstruction. And if you can pack them in a little closer, you can lower your energy threshold. It turns out if, you know, within about a factor of three, you can also get higher angular resolution cameras that help you a lot. And if you make a field of view larger, you also do much better at higher energies, because field of view isn't just seeing things on the sky. It's containing the full extensive air shower, which you saturate out in Veritas. It's why our effective area turns over at about 8 TeV. So, how do you do this? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to build something called the Cherenkov Telescope Array. Its main goals are to improve the sensitivity by a factor of 10 and the angular resolution in our field by a factor of 3. And you do this with a graded array of telescopes. You're going to have some big telescopes, some medium-sized telescopes, and the little guys you can't see out here, some small telescopes. What does a factor of 10 mean? Well, the Veritas M82 Nature paper required 137 hours of data. It would mean that CTA would do this study in one hour. Okay? How are we going to ever fund something like this, which will cost about $400 million? Well, the idea is to create an open observatory with both northern and southern sites to provide full sky coverage. Now, of course, you need a bunch of physicists and astronomers to build this, so 40% of the first 10 years, and it's really stacked heavily on those first two years of the 10 years, is for consortium members to do key science projects. And these key science projects are things that don't lend themselves well to one-year TAC proposals, sort of like a 10-year baseline study or an overall survey, things like that. The construction is going to begin next year. 
It's, it's really right on us. It's not a hypothetical. And it's going to take about five, six years to finish. And then our pro U.S. participation in this project was endorsed in Astro 2010. Um, and, you know, we'll see if that happens. In order to make a big project like this go, it takes a worldwide consortium, about 30 countries, 1,400 scientists, you know, 208 institutes, a lot of people. These meetings are big. Okay, and so what are the major requirements of CTA? Well, we want to push the energy coverage down to 20 GeV. These are some of the scientific drivers. I won't read them off. Um, We're going to push the energy coverage up to 300 TeV. We want to have good energy resolution, meaning 10 to 15 percent. Veritas is about 17 percent. You really can't do much better just because the atmosphere is your calorimeter, unless you're going to be flying air balloons or running drones all the time up in the sky. It's very hard to do much better. Um, we're going to have a large field of view of 8 to 10 degrees. We're going to rapidly slew, meaning 20 seconds. Um, Veritas goes around in about, uh, it's a degree a second that gives you an idea. I've seen these CTA telescopes, these you know, 50 ton structures move 180 degrees in 20 seconds. It's, it's amazing. Um, I have 10 times the sensitivity in collection area and the angular resolution you know, will be less than a, a tenth of a degree um, for all of the energy range. So this is what, where CTA stands. There's going to be a north and a south. The northern site is La Palma in Spain. The site agreement is signed. That's right there. The southern site is ESO Paranal, Chile. It's right there. Um, you can see the artist uh, thing. That site agreement was more or less signed when I last you know, heard um, you know, a few weeks ago. I don't, I'm not sure if it's been signed, sealed, and delivered just yet. The northern site is going to have four large-sized telescopes and 15 medium-sized telescopes. It's focused very much on the lower energies, AGN science. Um, and at the northern side is going to be focused on higher energies, which is why you have these small-sized telescopes, which are only sensitive to high-energy photons. Um, and that's why it's a little bit bigger, spread out over a larger area. And, of course, the galactic center is down in the south, which is why you focus uh, the science there. Just to give you an idea of the sensitivity and the energy range of this thing, here is Veritas in green. You see Magic, our competitors. There's Hess. Um, the CTA northern site is right there, and the southern site, which is the superior um, site in terms of instrumentation, um, is down there. And you can see just the, how far you push this thing down in sensitivity. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, and these are based on simulations, not, not hopes and dreams. Um, OK. So what is the science you can do with CTA? Well, I can't possibly tell you about it all in the next five or so minutes. So what I will do is just tell you that there's a 200-page refereed book that's going to go on the archive any day now. Um, and I'll show you my three favorite snippets. We're going to do a faster and deeper survey. This is the existing HESS survey. This is the existing largest field of view instrument known. We can do the survey. This survey has about 1,500 hours of data in it. And this is only the inner snippet, of course. We can do that in five hours, you know, 1,500 hours to five. I mean, you think about that. Um, now, obviously, you wouldn't do it in five hours. You would do a more uh, coherent job. Um, but this is what the CTA survey will look like in terms of sources, you know, simulated. And there's the eight-degree field of view. That's going to be a typical CTA instrument um, there. Um, you can see what we plan to do pushing down the sensitivity in terms of millicrab. Um, in the first year, we'll hit about three millicrab in the central region and then four uh, going out that way, and then this is the 10-year survey sensitivity where it'll be below, um, below 4 millicrab all across the galactic plane. Okay, what are sources going to look like, galactic sources going to look like? Well, this is SN1006. We all know it from these beautiful limbs you see out here. This is kind of what SN1006 looks like. If, if you're like me and don't see very well um, without your contact lenses, you wake up in the morning, everything's a blur. Um, that's better than I see, but this is what it will look like now with CTA. You can actually start to resolve the limb features and things like that. Um, and why is that important other than for making pretty pictures? Well, you can actually do science with VHE morphology. This is RxJ 1713 plus a lot of numbers right there. Um, this is an actual Hess image from 2016. And what, this is what it looks like simulated by the CTA consortium if it's a leptonically dominated emitter, meaning it more... Uh, more uh, electrons dominating the VHE emission 100 times or proton dominated by 100 times. And you can see just with your own eyes that the proton case looks very different from a leptonically dominated case. And so in a 50-hour observation, CTA can use the morphology alone to discriminate between the fully leptonic and hadronic emission scenarios. So meaning you have a very different way of looking at it. You saw those modeling curves from before. Now you can do it with a different uh, case study on how to do things. 
Okay, and then another plot I wanted to show is just the improved temporal studies. I mean, I think we all realize you're going to have much better spectrum for SED studies. So I wanted to show the temporal studies. This is a plot I made 11 years ago when I was a postdoc on Hess. You had this great flare of Parks 2155, this AGN. This is actually the crab, the brightest DC source on the sky. The DC flux from this thing is actually seven times lower. So this is a factor of 100 sort of variations from this object. Um, you know, and these are one minute bins, so the time scale of this rise is three minutes. I think this one was one minute. Just ridiculous stuff from a galaxy. And this is now the CTA, what CTA would see. And the things you'll know are different is that the threshold here is 50 GeV, so the threshold is lower. And I think these are five or 10 second bins, and you just completely oversample this. Like, I would have loved to have claimed 60 second variation right here, but you know, I just didn't have the error bars given the data. And so, you know, you completely resolve that at this point, and you just can claim so many more amazing things. Okay, so I'm going to finish up by just showing you that the CTA prototyping is near complete. This is the large size telescope that we're going to build for CTA. It's 23 meter parabolic reflector. It's going to have a four and a half degree field of view. That's the foundation. All the components are procured and fabricated. It got hung up by some local tax issues. It should have been completed by the end of the year, but it'll be finished by early next year. This is the prototype mid-sized telescope. There's two flavors. I'll talk one about one in more detail in a second. But this is sort of a Veritas thing. It's got a you know, it's a 12 meter thing with a 16 meter focal length, so a little bit longer going this way. It'll have an eight degree field. There's one of a prototype cameras. Um, you can see from that. Um, there are three small size prototypes you see here. There's gonna be of order 70 of these things that are diameters about four meters. One of these has a single mirror. Two of these have dual mirrors. And these are all real life prototypes, not simulations. These things exist. Um, and then here is the prototype two mirror telescope from a mid-size thing. This is nine and a half meters across. Okay, and why would you build a two-mirror telescope? Well, the idea here is you get a uniform optical point spread function over the wide field of view. Okay, and, and so that's, that's great stuff because, I mean, with the Veritas, it really, you know, starts to fall off as you get to the edge of the camera. But what this also does is it allows you to have really compact cameras. Yeah, I remember I told you the Veritas camera is the size of a car. Here you're now talking 60 centimeters and things like this. So, um, so we're building this thing at the Whipple Observatory. It's a $5 million project with finish it up in 2017. We're actually putting on the optics right now. Um, and it's a candidate from a medium-sized telescope. There's going to be some selection. And so why would you build this? Again, it's to get a finer resolution camera. These are some gold-plated images. Obviously, you select them by hand and convey the meaning. But you can see that this is what the, the sort of Veritas-like camera looks at an image, and it's the identical image in, a, in the two-mirror telescope that we're prototyping at FLWO, and I think the images speak for themselves, how much better you see things and what you can do with them. This is a gamma ray shower in a background. And while it looks you know, amazing with the gold-plated image, you can imagine what you can do with the less well-resolved images. Yep. Okay, so there's a second to last slide. Um, so where does CTA stand? Well, we've got the hosting agreements and the site preparations were started this year and last year, and basically we're done. We're doing some geotechnical studies. We're going to start construction next year. Um, we're going to start it once we hit the 65% funding level. We're about 20 or so million short right now. Um, so we'll, we'll hit that soon, and then we'll go. And the idea is we're going to start with a threshold implementation, meaning we will go once we feel we have enough money to build something that we could live with. You don't want to build something that isn't going to be, you know, that much of an improvement. Then as more funding and telescopes come in, we'll complete the baseline design. It'll take us about six years, and we plan to do some science, obviously, with, with a, you know, the, you know, partial array. And so, um, in conclusion, I just wanted to say that Veritas is running very well. It's funded to operate through at least 2019. We're looking at the possibility of operating, you know, beyond that, but it's going to be most likely non-traditional. Um, it was a challenging time, I think, as we all know. Um, the past decade of Veritas has been has exceeded expectations. We now have about 60 sources. I, I think this will go up by about 10 before 2019. Um, we have 97 refereed publications, 55 theses, and 11,000 hours of good data. If you remember anything, the CTA is going to bring an order of magnitude sensitivity increase to VHE astrophysics. It should launch an era of about 1,000 sources. The prototyping is nearly finished, and we're going to start construction next year. Um, and the U.S. groups are aiming to contribute $25 million to CTA. We're looking to NSF physics and astronomy um, for this. The goal of this is to contribute 15 of these dual mirror telescopes I showed you uh, via an international partnership. You can't build 15 with $25 million, but we have some Italian friends who might do the mirrors for us and some of the cameras for us and things like that. 
Um, and SAO may be the managing organization for the U.S. construction component. And with that, I'll thank you. And for those who don't get to see my baby pictures often enough, there you go. <laughs> Actually, now that you know we're 10 years down the line and have done simulations for CTA, it turned out that that was a net benefit. Wow. <laughs> so it, 10, 15 years ago, there were all these studies showing you only know, wanted to put yourself up at uh, you know, 5K even or 2.5K where you know, Kit Peak was and things like this. It turns out, for reasons that I, I'm actually a little bit in a haze right now, um, turns out that you want to be at slightly lower altitude. And so where we are at, at 1,800 meters is actually the, the sweet spot. And so uh, one of the CTA sites in Namibia was actually even lower than we are, and that actually was even better. And so when CTA were doing its simulations, they caught us completely off guard because we had studied all of these sites way up high. And then when we, we did this site study for Namibia, and we found, why is this thing so strong? It turned out that the elevation was so low, we had to quickly go back and do other Chilean studies to push it down. Um, so, so that turned out to be a net benefit and a complete surprise. Hi, nice talk. Um, actually, I have two questions. Uh, first one, kind of science. You were talking about those poles I made, do you? Mm -hmm. um, have you tried to do a joint thing with, say, Chandra or other x-rays? Because you should see x-rays from those. Um, so there have been a number of studies. I mean, this is more of a bailiwick of Hess because they have so many pulsar wind nebula, of course. Um, and they have done a lot of these sort of joint types of studies where they do a population. And it's a lot of the pulsar wind nebula, like high spin down luminosity pulsars. Um, E dot over D squared kind of things. They find these correlations and, and do all of these types of studies. But yeah, I mean, a lot of the problem is that um, you get a lot of these TV pulsar wind nebula where there's very plausible reasons that the X-ray emission may have died out over time, um, and so that you won't necessarily see the X-ray emission. But because of radiation lifetimes, I have to brush up on the explanation a bit, um, that the TV emission is still there. Okay, now the other thing is more looking towards the future of this stuff. Uh, do you have plans for how to handle the data and are you in touch with the Virtual Observatory, International Virtual Observatory, standards and all that good stuff? I mean, we can work together. Um, yeah, so there, there are people working on the data standards and the data center and things like that. They're largely based in France. Um, one of the guys in my wedding picture, Carl Kosak, um, is sort of leading the charge on that. And uh, Catherine Wilson, who I think you, you probably know very well, is also pushing that very hard. And so we do have a lot of things going on there. Um, and there's a work group and they, they need help. But um, yes, we, we do have a lot of things going on to try to make sure that this product is ready for people because you can't spend four hundred million dollars in promising to the community without it right. being done right and uh, I'm, I'm, they need all the help they can get I'm sure. So. All right now if they're French they're probably plugged in. But. Yes. Jessica? <laughs> Are there any other transients in the sky that you see with all these you since you have all these images collected? Are there things that aren't cosmic rays they're still cosmic and not um, well, so, I mean, that's... That are interesting. Well, I mean, we, we do all kinds of transient studies. I mean, these things are large optical collectors, and so we actually look for optical transients with these things, and, you know, bright flashes. We have an OSETI program, which I didn't highlight here, um, oh. which is of, of considerable interest to some people. Um, and so, you know, basically we have these 10-meter dishes and very fast electronics, and so you can look for nanosecond flashes on the sky. A lot of the things you pick up are sort of shooting stars, meteorites, satellites, but um, we have gone through part of the optical study catalog um, and we published some limits from this and uh, we have an exploratory program where we're continuing to work on this as well. Um, so, yeah. 
So when, when the uh, Ice Cube Neutrino Telescope was proposed, they pointed at Veritas and said, you know, these sources of 50 ter TeV, it is absolutely certain that every single one of them is going to be seen by Ice Cube. And that seems now not to be true. So is that understood? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is to some degree. Um, and so, I mean, you know, I think m many of the things going back to, uh, you know, you see these supernova remnants, um, which would be, you know, if they were hadronic accelerators, would be clear ice cube sources. Um, and many of the ones that we've now seen um, up to 100 TeV, these very ones that are, you know, giving off the highest energy gamma rays are leptonic accelerators, so they're not things for ice cube. And it starts, when we start looking at it, the fluxes we're measuring, um, the acceleration mechanisms we're finding through our modeling are showing that, you know, ice cube aren't going to see many things. And I want to be a little careful how I say that. And they don't. <laughs> and they don't. And so. Um, so I, I would just clarify that the Supernova remnants that are quote leptonic <clears throat> are not. They are they are almost certainly accelerating hadrons as well. Yes. It's just that those hadrons aren't bashing into anything, uh, so we don't see the gamma rays from them, and therefore wouldn't see neutrinos. The pulsar wind nebulae that you mentioned, which there's so many of, those are all there, there's no hadrons being accelerated there, so you don't have any collisions that make the neutrinos. So so Ice Cube loses out on those. So that's why we're, we're looking at the transient things, hoping that you somehow get AGM doing something from the year, you know, the GRB or something. But what about Winston, the supernova remnant you did show? Was it was it Tycho, or what was it that showed clearly? Yeah, so I mean, Tycho was very soft, so it's part of the problem there. His fluxes are low. Um, you know, IC443 is the same thing. I mean, these beautiful Hess S and R, I mean, if you're careful what I said about my competitors that have these power loss spectrum that can go up to 150 TeV, you know, we, we don't have that. So. Do they have that because they've surveyed the plane more than you guys have? Uh, have you done the whole northern plane? Um, we, we have not surveyed the entire northern plane. We've done the Cygnus region and select areas. Um, part of the issue for us is that um, the monsoons you know, kill our ability to really hit the, the galactic bands and so it, you, you have to you have to pick and choose effectively so like you go for the obvious targets and survey the best regions we, we don't have enough time to comprehensively do it at the depth that Hess would do it. and so so there's a little bit of that but Hess also just happens to have better objects down there and by virtue of them being in the central galactic plane so Charles about um, the classic image of that jet is very much a one-sided jet, but I think your Veritas data seems to suggest a lot more structure on the, on the opposite side. I know, maybe I'm some, some um, so none of Veritas would be a blob, so I... I okay, that. so let, yes, I'm just wondering what it must have been saw. The radio <laughs> image I had up there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but, so that's... So, okay, so we got radio down, radio, radio, radio. Oh, that's that's, that's on the top left. That is, that's right. that's right. yeah, that's that's a huge, huge, huge abrasion on that. That's the radio. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I thought it was. The yellowish thing was low frequency radio. Oh, that. Yeah. I'm an expert to tell. On the left, on the right. Okay. But that's old. Yeah, yeah. So I will ask the last question uh, about the varied observations of gamma ray bursts. How fast can you move the entire array to observe gamma ray bursts? Um, well, so we slew at a degree a second. We've actually explored it going faster. We even did an engineering study to see what we could take. It's the breaking that you worry about. Um, uh, so if you go up to a degree and a half, it potentially not destroy it at two degrees, you destroy it. Um, uh, um, so, but we're going to keep it at one. Um, the fastest we've gotten on a target is a border of 50 seconds, um, which is pretty good. We had one gamma ray burst that, um, had we been able to 
it just went off the day before we had observers. And had we been there based on what Fermilat had seen, we, I don't want to say surely, but I, I feel like we would have gotten it. Um, but other than that, we haven't had any luck. So we've looked at about 200 now. So. Thank you, Mr. Again.